Okay, I'm so not used to speaking into mics, but I'll try. So, as I said a little bit earlier today, when we had a presentation for our teachers, I can't recall a single time ever in my um, 18 years in formal Jewish education where I ever really felt or thought the notion that there is an issue of our day. There are always little problems, some big problems, some affected this school, some affected that school, some affected this community, some affected that one. But nowadays, and when I say nowadays, I mean specifically really in the last year, maybe two years, educators across the spectrum, psychologists, doctors, people throughout the world are really all kind of coming together and in fully recognizing that there is an issue of the day, and that is this topic, the topic of technology, our devices, and more specifically, our relationship to them, and really specifically, our children, and how our children are using them and relating to them, and how that's impacting their life currently, and how it's going to impact their life in the years ahead. This is really the issue of the day. Look at the newspapers, look at the magazines, you're gonna hear it and see it more and more and more. I'm gonna let the experts, of course, share the details, but that's why we made a big deal and asked you to come out at night. It's very, very rare that we ask our parents to come out for a night program because we recognize how hard it is. Young children, a lot going on. Some of you live quite a distance. It is not easy, we know. But those of you who are here are already making a major statement and already making a commitment to say that this is something important to me and my family. I care about my children deeply and I want to do what's best for them. So that's why you're here and thank you for being here tonight. Um, before I just give a brief, kind of just to frame the evening and what we're going to do for the next little while, uh, I just want to mention a few thank yous. First of all, thank you to our amazing PTA for sponsoring tonight. Thank you to uh, the three people who put in uh, the work to organize the entire thing. Dr. Jordana Carmel, Dr. Kanina Dorfman, and Ms. Kim Sivik. So thank you. The program's gonna work as follows. I'm gonna pass uh, the mic over to, um, to Dr. Ellie Shapiro and Ms. Nima Felton. They are with the Digital Citizenship Project, and they have uh, really more experience than probably anybody out there in the world, um, because they have not only been examining this topic, okay, a lot of people out there are examining it, but they've been examining it specifically through the lens uh, of the Jewish world, specifically the Orthodox slash modern Orthodox world. They have a lot they can share. After the, um, the beginning presentation, which will go for about an hour, maybe a little bit longer, we're going to ask you to break up into some groups. We'll explain that more a little bit later on, but to get some small discussion groups. The reason for that is we recognize that you're probably going to hear a lot of information tonight that's going to motivate you, inspire you, and say, hey, you know, I really feel I can do more for, for myself and for my children, for my family, to, make, uh, to help uh, our children grow to be bit better, digital citizens, but it's really hard to do this alone, right? Everybody here knows who have children over the age of five, that as strong as you may be as a parent, or as strict as you may be, or this isn't about strict, by the way, you'll soon learn, but whatever you feel you can do in the home, it's really not enough because your children are part of these intricate social networks. And what the parents next door are doing or are not doing is going to impact your child whether you like it or not. So if we kind of come together, have those healthy conversations, maybe even create some mutual understandings and ultimately some communal and social norms, that will have a huge impact on our community and our school. Because our goal here, remember, is not just to kind of inspire you or motivate you. We want you walking out tonight with practical steps, practical advice, something that you could do, talk about with your friends tonight, and kind of implement and bring into your lives going forward in the next days and weeks and months ahead. So without further ado, passing it over to Dr. Ellie Shapiro. Thank you so much, Dr. Englander. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carmel. Thank you. 
really being here is just amazing. I'm so excited about it. I was here about a year ago um, with a, you guys opened your doors for a conference that we're doing in education. And really, I think uh, Rabbi Englander has it right. The issue of the day is technology. Um, and we're really struggling with it in so many ways. And a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight might be intuitive to you. It might be something that you're sensing, you're feeling, um, how technology is impacting your home life, your children. Uh, but today we're really going to make those issues transparent and provide you with strategies to, uh, to go home with. So the first thing that we want to recognize is that it's not just about the internet, it's about technology as a whole. Okay? A lot of times the paradigm has been it's the internet, the internet's good, the internet. it's about technology and how we relate to it. Just before we begin, just give me one second. So technology is impacting our lives. Really, we're inundated with it. We, it, it, it impacts almost every aspect of our life. Somebody raise their hands, how many of you experience what we call phantom vibrations? That's when your body's vibrating and, and so me, this guy, that guy, we know, right? Okay. That is what technology has done. We don't know where our bodies end and the technology begins. We're so inundated with devices, with e-watches, with e-readers, with um, I was at, out to lunch with a friend of mine recently and he kept doing this, right? And I was like, do you have somewhere to be? And uh, obviously he had the iWatch. The norms have changed. What is normal and what is appropriate when it comes to technology uh, has really changed how we live our lives. What happens when you're typing in all caps? What does that mean? I don't hear you, sorry, you're what? Oh, shouting, okay, good. Um, so we've established that, right? Typing in all caps. What about when you're checking your watch uh, for time. What about other behaviors when it comes to technology? We haven't really established what is normal and what is appropriate. For example, if a public speaker stops speaking and takes a selfie in the middle of it, is that normal? No? You make me feel bad. Thank you. Someone's validating my feelings. Um, really, so it's amazing where we are trying to establish norms of appropriate and responsible behavior. By the way, 89% of people experience phantom vibrations. And so this is where we are at with technology. And so we use the term digital citizenship. What is digital citizenship? It's not a new uh, government plan to create new citizens through the internet or digital technology. It's the norms of appropriate and responsible behavior. And we want to help our kids develop that. Our kids are growing up in this technology-based and driven world. And we want to help our kids maximize that. There's a great term being used uh, these days called future ready. Are our children future ready? Whatever the technology is today, where it's going to be in 10 years when our, many of our children are entering the job market is going to be totally different. Just think where we were 10 years ago. Really, a lot of changes. And the challenges that we experience when it comes to technology, we would like to have a very simple solution. We'd like to say, if we just hold <laughs> off on giving our kids devices, if we just filter it, if we just, I don't know, uh, no social media, I was meeting with an elected official in New York about a year ago because they introduced uh, something called the uh, Smart School Bond Act where they were giving billions of dollars to New York, City, New York State schools for technology. And I asked about digital citizenship and teaching responsibility. And she said to me, she goes, why can't the kids just not go on social media? Wouldn't that just solve everything? And so this magic pill really is not something that is realistic. So any of you who came for the magic pill tonight, I'm not dispensing any. Um, it's going to be a little more complex than that. But before we move on, I'd like to show you a video from 1984 that I, uh, I feel, well, it'll speak for itself. Imagine, if you will, sitting down to your morning coffee, turning on your home computer to read the day's newspaper. Well, it's not as far-fetched as it may seem. In fact, both local San Francisco papers are investing a lot of money to try and get to service just like that started. Science editor Steve Newman reports on one person already using the brand new system. 17 stories up in his fashionable North Beach apartment, Richard Halloran is calling a local number that will connect him with a computer in Columbus, Ohio. Meanwhile, across town in this less than fashionable cubbyhole at the San Francisco Examiner, these editors are programming today's copy of the paper into that same Ohio computer. When the telephone connection between these two terminals is made, the newest form of electronic journalism lights up Mr. Halloran's television with just about everything the Examiner prints in its regular edition. That is, with the exception of pictures, ads, and the comics. 
Eight newspapers around the country are currently in the computer network, and within the next few weeks, three others will join in. This is an experiment. We're trying to figure out what it's going to mean to us as editors and reporters and what it means to the home user. And, and we're not in it to make money. We're uh, probably uh, uh, not going to lose a lot, but we aren't going to make much either. It's Both the Examiner and Chronicle began service within the last two weeks and printed full-page ads about it. Of the estimated two to 3,000 home computer owners in the Bay Area, the Chronicle reports over 500 have responded by sending back coupons. Even though the electronic newspaper isn't as spiffy looking as the ads imply, people using the system are excited about its potential. With this system, we have the option not only of seeing the newspaper on the screen, but also we, optionally we can copy it. So anything we're interested in, we could go back in again and copy it onto paper and save it, which I think is, a great, is, is the future of the type of interrogation an individual will give to the newspapers. This is only the first step in newspapers by computer. Engineers now predict the day will come when we get all our newspapers and magazines by home computer, but that's a few years off. So for the moment at least, this fellow isn't worried about being out of a job. Steve Newman, New Center 4. Well, it takes over two hours to receive the entire text of the newspaper over the phone, and with an hourly use charge of $5, the new telepaper won't be much competition for the 20-cent street edition. I love that video. <clears throat> this is from 1982, so really not such a long time ago. How many of you remember 1982? Okay, some of you. How many of you remember 72? 62, anyone? 62? I'm not going to keep going. Someone in the back. <clears throat> really, uh, for 82 to now, where we have come such a long way, and even just in the past 10 years, what has happened with technology since uh, the iPhone came out, the availability, really moving, fa moving at such a, a rate, at such a speed, we don't necessarily have the opportunity to implement technology into our lives in a healthy way. The newest gadgets, the newest gizmo. Um, this holiday season, was it the Echo Dot was the biggest seller? Um, any, who has the Echo Dot? Right? So we bring it into our homes and, you know, what, that's not, what's it, Alexa? Alexa. Alexa. Alexa, play, whatever. But we incorporate it into the fabric of our lives, sometimes not necessarily approaching it in a strategic way. And so our goal today is to talk about how technology is awesome and it's amazing and it enhances our lives in so many ways, but also to take a more thoughtful and deliberative approach to managing the technology. Technology. Um, it, it's amazing. I, I say that we live in the best of times and the worst of times. If that line sounds familiar, they ripped it off for me. Um, but the, the line goes, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. And I think when we think about the times we're living in now, we really truly do live in the age of wisdom and in the age of foolishness. Technology offers us accessibility, productivity, information, connectivity, all these amazing opportunities, so many ways to connect with other people socially, productivity-wise, educationally. Technology is amazing. Our kids are learning with so much data and so much benchmarking and really that we know what they know, when they know it, how they know it, and what we can do to improve it. Technology is just wonderful in so many different ways but it also impacts us negatively, also the worst of times. It's also the age of foolishness because technology impacts our social functioning, our behavioral functioning, our psychological functioning, and day-to-day -day functioning. And that's what we're going to talk about today, some of those areas of impact. I don't think I have to tell you, uh, I will though, uh, kids spend a lot of time on their devices. Just by a raise of hands, how many of you have noticed that your children like their devices or your devices and spending time on it? Um, so they spend a lot of time on devices. Um, but the truth is, we like our devices too. We like technology as well. The UN did a study recently um, and they found that uh, 6 billion out of the world, 7 billion people owned a mobile phone, but only four and a half had a toilet. Right? So I, I, I know, what are you going to do on a toilet if you don't have a phone? I get it. I understand. Uh, you want to get the low hanging fruit, get the, get the phone and we'll figure out the indoor plumbing later. Uh, but clearly there's a priority that we have towards uh, technology. One of the other challenges we have uh, is a generational disconnect. You ever get that feeling your kids know more about technology than you do? Unless it's a room full of ed tech computer programmer types, is it? Okay. I feel like my kid knows more about uh, A lot of people do. And we have this generational disconnect. Um, I often look at this uh, text between a mother and uh, son. 
Your great aunt just passed away, LOL. Why is that funny? It's not funny, David, what do you mean? Mom, LOL means laughing out loud. Oh my goodness, I sent that to everyone. I thought it meant lots of love. <laughs> she likes that one. All right. And, and we laugh and we go, we've all been there though. We have all haven't quite gotten the lingo at different points. Our kids are speaking a different language and it creates this generational disconnect. Um, if we look at Beatrice, the offline oversharer. Instead of mailing everyone my vacation photos, I'm saving a ton of time by posting them to my wall. Ooh, I like that one. It's so quick. It's just like my car insurance. I save 15% in just 15 minutes. I save more than that in half the time. I unfriend you. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. <laughs> we, we, we laugh, we do. Uh, but we're all there a little bit. We don't quite get it. My daughter tells me all the time, I'm just not getting it. So she must know something that I don't. But I can tell you one thing, she doesn't know what this is. And she certainly doesn't know the relationship between these two items. <laughs> so we got that going for us. Uh, and things are moving so quickly and we have this generational disconnect. Um, you know, I have to change this next slide. This was done two years ago when Facebook had only 1.2 billion users. Now they have, I think, about 2 billion uh, users. And again, that's just in a period of two or three years. And our apps and the uh, applications available to us Things are moving at such a quick rate and kids are getting devices at a quicker rate and they're getting different apps at a quicker rate. It's really become part of the fabric of our lives and once again, we really need to focus on how to manage that. You're gonna hear a lot of statistics from me tonight. Some people say that I focus too much on statistics. Actually about 71% of you say I focus too much on statistics. But it's really important to have the data um, that we're moving forward with and so, uh, some of the data that you're going to hear are of similar communities to here. Um, as uh, Rabbi Englander mentioned, I've been collecting data from Jewish day schools across the United States. 41% of kids, uh, this is 5th through 8th grade students, this data that we've selected. 41% uh, of kids own a smartphone, uh, but 81% of them own an internet capable device. This is again 5th through 8th grade. Now that is not to say that just because they don't own a device doesn't mean they don't have a device. Uh, most kids, even as young as uh, preschool, have access to devices regularly, whether it's the old family uh, iPad or whether it's a Kindle or whether it's you know, mom's phone. They have devices and they are pretty proficient in it. I was actually in Los Angeles uh, speaking a little while ago and a parent came over to me after the speech saying that he was taking a nap and his three-year-old daughter came in and took his phone and took his finger and put it on the phone and opened up the device. And he wasn't really sure whether to be angry or proud. It was one of those parenting moments where you're not sure how to respond. Uh, but our kids are really proficient and knowledgeable. 84% of kids, again, it's the same population, fifth through eighth grade, uh, are active users of social media. And social media also has become a big challenge uh, for their social lives, for their connectivity with other people, cyberbullying, exclusion, impulsivity. These are some of the issues we're going to talk about uh, today as well. Um, they told me that the Wi Fi is down, so I'm going to log in the old fashioned way. You've got mail. Everybody remember that? There's like a certain nostalgic connectivity that we have to that. We would literally wait, you know, hours just to get online. You'd get those, remember those discs, 99 free hours, and you know, you'd get a phone number, and there was like one local phone number for everyone in Boca Raton, and, and like someone would find out about a new number to log into, and you could log in, and you'd go through the whole process, you'd finally log in, and there was absolutely nothing to do online. But we were there, we could play chess with someone in Russia, which was very exciting, except they're much better at chess than we are, so um, we didn't get very far with that. But really, we've advanced in such a way where that instantly, instantly, we expect our technology to be available to us 
Um, and so we are impacted by our technology. The impacted domains we mentioned before, behavioral, social, psychological, and day-to-day, -day, these are the core areas that we're gonna focus on. Behavioral, uh, the digital realm promotes different behavioral changes uh, that, um, or how it impacts dependence, distraction, impulsivity, disinhibition. Uh, I think we're all familiar with dependence and distraction. Uh, we're dependent on our devices, we spend a lot of time on them, our kids even more so. How many of you, your kids are playing a game and you say, okay, it's time to turn it off and they say, what do they say? Okay, mom, or okay, no, they don't say that. Five, Five more minutes, or, or I have to finish the level. They are constantly having to finish the level um, and somehow it never saves at mid-level. Distraction, kids are uh, distracted, but the two areas that I'd like to focus on briefly are impulsivity and disinhibition. These are two under-focused uh, areas of technology. One in three students admit to having emailed or texted something that they later regretted. That is that idea of impulsivity. Technology promotes me putting something out there without thinking it through, without taking the time. When I was a kid, when uh, we'd get angry, <coughs> when I would get angry at someone, I was told, you know, write them a letter and put it in an envelope, and by the time, wait a week, and by the time you're ready to mail it, usually the issue has resolved itself. Try explaining that to a child today, or even an adult today. When we're angry, when we're upset, we comment, we blog, we tweet, we email, we text, we message, and these are the things that we do today, that idea of waiting, holding back, uh, avoiding the impulsive response is something, not something that we do today. And it's something that we need to teach our kids because kids by their very nature tend to be a little more impulsive than adults. And then you add technology to the mix and it can create uh, some challenges. More than half of adults have also uh, posted or messaging that they later regretted. 22% report doing so weekly. So this is not just a childhood issue. And I think a lot of what we're gonna talk about today um, I get to see all of you, and I'm going to say certain things, and you're going to be like, yeah, 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 me also. And so we have to tap in a little bit to our own relationships with technology, our own habits with technology as well. Online disinhibition. Online disinhibition is when I do or say things uh, online that I wouldn't normally do or say in a face-to-face -face conversation. Sometimes we're more comfortable texting something to somebody than saying it to their face. That's online disinhibition, when there's that separation through the electronic medium. So the disinhibition, I'm more likely to do or say something than I would in a face-to-face -face conversation. And that can create a lot of issues amongst teams where they communicate differently. Um, even the Pew Foundation found that, um, that the majority of the kids that they were studying reported that my friends act differently online than they do in real life. And so when you add impulsivity and disinhibition to what technology does, that's a dangerous mix for kids. The dangerous mix because of, well, we're going to learn a little more about the public and permanent nature of, of technology. The, oh wow, I feel like I put on those noise canceling headphones all of a sudden. Thank you. Um, there, there's a positive correlation between online aggression um, and anonymity. It's not new. Anyone who took Psych 101, you took uh, uh, Stanley Milgram, the electroshock studies, um, Philip Zimbardo. Uh, they found that when anonymity came into play, people would deliver longer, stronger, even fatal shocks uh, during these experiments. And so it's not a new concept, but it's something that, as a result of technology, has been exacerbated. Um, and so we have the impulsivity and the, the disinhibition. Another issue we see with kids today is that they sleep with their devices within reach. Um, if I raise a hand, I'm assuming about 80% of you your kids that have devices, they sleep with them within reach. Why do they sleep with them within reach? So the alarm clock has gone all the way down here. I'm from New York, so I know that. Yeah, so they say an alarm clock. Um, do they have amazing savings down here? Or dollar store type? Yeah. So they sell those ones with the big red numbers with the built-in alarm clock. Those work great, too. In fact, they're probably more annoying than the, uh, the cell phones. So they sleep with them. Why is this an issue if they sleep with their devices within reach? Don't be shy. Sleep, yeah, it, it, it impacts their sleep uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is they're on their devices until really late at night, whether you know it or not. Uh, they have their grade chats, they have their friend chats. Let, we're assuming, by the way, everything they're doing is 100% uh, kosher and uh, you know, they're not doing anything they really shouldn't be doing. Just regular behavior, regular activity, regular reading. 
know, we used to sleep with the flashlight in our books in our, you know, under the blanket. Um, and so there's actually a, a scientific difference between that and looking at devices. Harvard did a study in 2014, and they compared people reading from e-readers before going to bed and reading from books before going to bed. They actually studied this. And uh, what they found was, I mean, I don't know how much studying you have to do. You all know what happens when you're in bed and you take a book out. Relatively quickly, you're asleep. The truth is, I have a book on my night table that I've been reading for eight months. I am still on the third page. <laughs> And uh, I fall asleep rather quickly from it. But with the e-reader, the blue light and the light from the device actually impacted sleep. Uh, it impacted melatonin production. It tricks the brain into thinking that it's daytime. So it's actually more difficult to fall asleep, and the quality of the sleep is uh, is uh, not as is, is not as good either. Um, there's a term called FOMO. You guys are familiar with that? Fear of missing out. So what happens also for kids, if their device is next to their bed, they think that some really important disclosure or communication is going to come through their grave chat, or something along those lines at 3 in the morning. And so they don't actually fall asleep to the same degree that they would if they weren't worried about something coming on their chat. And so sleeping with devices within reach actually has a tremendous impact on sleep. And sleep is one of the greatest predictors uh, for academic, for kids achieving their maximum academic performance. Uh, kids who don't sleep well don't perform well in school. And so teachers, uh, we met with the teachers earlier today, they know right away when a child comes in and did not get a good night's sleep. You can see it on their face. And if we want our kids to achieve academic academically, socially, uh, we really want them to get a good night's sleep and not having devices next to their beds uh, is a great uh, step in that direction. 86% of kids report going to sleep uh, late as a result of their technology. So these are the kids reporting that. These are Jewish day school students reporting that they go to bed uh, late as a result of their technology. So they are aware of it. One of the greatest <laughs> gifts that we can give our kids uh, is the gift of a good night's sleep. And if we can help them get there and not have that FOMO, and we're going to discuss some strategies a little later, uh, that would be tremendously powerful for them. So uh, this slide obviously doesn't fit in with a lot of you know, the branding that you saw until now. I have here to remind me about a meeting that I had uh, last winter with the New York Mets. Um, and i just like to tell the story that I had a meeting last winter with the New York Mets. <laughs> we can move on uh, from there. But we actually had a meeting about how digital technology impacts focus, concentration, dependence, all those things. Uh, and the same way that our kids are impacted academically and in school, we are impacted in our jobs and careers. There's a lot of data on distractibility and job performance as a result of personal technology. That's a whole separate lecture for the corporate world. But what they actually told me was, in meeting with um, a couple of the vice presidents there, that one of their players uh, was taking frequent bathroom breaks uh, during the game. And they actually had a medical concern. You know, you want to make sure that your players are healthy. Um, and it turns out he was updating his Instagram feed during the game. This is, this is an amazing thing. You have, you know, 45,000 people in a stadium. Well, it's the Mets. So it was like 25,000 people in the stadium. Um, and you are going in and playing with your cell phone. That degree of dependence, that behavioral um, issue really uh, says a lot about what's happening for, uh, for professionals today as well as kids. So that's the behavioral piece. Socially, we see digital distraction, social dependence, online aggression, cyberbullying. We've been hearing a lot about cyberbullying uh, lately, uh, miscommunication. These are all issues that we, uh, that we see associated, social issues that we see with technology. Uh, digital disconnection, we see images like this all the time. Uh, I call it a regression to parallel play for the early childhood uh, teachers. Uh, and you know when kids are playing next to each other but not with each other, that's kind of what's happening today. I have to tell you, I made a note to, with Rabbi Englander, when you guys all came in, very few of you were on your phones. You were actually interacting with each other and communicating. You should give yourselves a round of applause because that really, uh, no really, that's really nice. Um, I was speaking with someone who uh, earlier who uh, runs a camp is involved with the camp. UCLA did a study in 2014, and uh, they actually measured kids' ability to read social expressions and facial cues uh, in social environments, and they got a baseline. 
And then they sent them to sleepaway camp and they measured them again. And the sleepaway camp didn't have technology. And what they found was in only five days, their ability to re read facial expressions and social cues and form more meaningful connections vastly improved. So it's a fascinating study because it tells us two things. One is that digital technology is having a negative impact on our social connectivity. Uh, two is that we can repair it. We can really address it by refraining from technology um, at times. And I think if we all think about when do we connect with our kids best? When do we, our family connections, most meaningful conversations? On Shabbos, when we don't have our devices, right? And so we also learn to appreciate the technology even more after the fact. Uh, I was recently asked um, what in my, what technological advancement has had the most significant impact on my life? I don't know why people ask me these things, it's because I speak about technology, I guess. And I was thinking about it, and the technological impact, the uh, advancement that had the biggest impact on my life was actually the creation of corrective glasses. I'm wearing contact lenses right now. But corrective glasses, I have terrible vision. I like negative 850 in one eye, eight in the other. I'm really blind. So I just think about all these things that I couldn't do if I couldn't see. But every once in a while when I'm wearing my glasses, I'll just take them off and just sit with it for a little bit and recognize how the technological advancement has profoundly impacted me. So similarly with, I think, the digital technology today, we need time away from it. We need time to be reflective and recognize what the experience is like without it and the way to connect and to be more self-aware and more thoughtful in how we utilize technology, even to connect with other people. So um, we actually, um, we have a group that we go out to dinner uh, fairly frequently in New York, a group of like four couples, and uh, we stack our phones in the middle of the uh, dining room table, of the table at the restaurant. Anybody do this? You stack, whoever grabs their phone first has to pay for dinner. That's, that's, the, that's the deal. And it's really the, the connections that you have is, is completely different than when you have your devices. We actually, there's one couple we invite because he can't keep his hands off his phone. <laughs> and so he's been paying for dinner for like, I don't know, a year and a half now. He hasn't realized that that's why we invite him. Um, but making eye contact, communicating is very important. So when you think about how much eye contact to make, I think 100% is a little creepy, right? <laughs> this guy's very comfortable with this. I don't know. I'm uncomfortable. So 100% is a little too much. Uh, ideally, you want to be making eye contact 60 to 70% of the time to formulate meaningful connections. And what we're doing, even adults, we're only making eye contact 30 to 60% of the time. And so we see diminished connectivity. The quality, quantitatively, we have hundreds if not thousands of friends and connections. But qualitatively, it's definitely uh, diminished and it's something that we want to focus on if we want to really uh, create more meaningful connections. Uh, even in, in relationships, husbands and wives and, and boyfriends and girlfriends, in, in, in relationships, when people are dating, where is the relationship, where is the connectivity coming from? Uh, and it's a different world uh, dating today than it was you know, 20 years ago. So these are things to think about. Miscommunication, uh, you ever send an email or a text and the person completely misunderstood what you were saying? Uh, or vice versa, where you received something and completely, uh, our paraverbal tone is about 80%, paraverbal communication is about 80% of communication. The words are secondary. And I'll prove it to you on a Friday night after you've washed for hamotzi and before you've actually had bread, you have whole conversations without saying a word. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Um, so you have these whole conversations. So we know it's not the words, but in the digital realm, all we have are the words. Uh, all we have are the words. And so a lot of times we have miscommunication and a lot of the digital drama that occurs amongst kids and adults uh, result from miscommunication. We just had the word whatever up there before. How many ways can you, you know, in your head, how many different tones can whatever be? It can be, you know, you know whatever, right? It's all good. Or it could be, whatever. It's not as good as the other whatever. Or it can be an angry whatever, right? So that's the same word, but the tone really uh, changes things. So cyberbullying is something that emerges uh, from these miscommunications, from impulsivity, from disinhibition. These are all the issues that we're facing with technology. And cyberbullying is one of these great issues that kids are facing today uh, that you really hear about horrific, horrific outcomes as a result of it. And so we need to help our kids to understand to uh, really 
uh, perspective take and really try to understand if I say this, how is it going to be interpreted? How is someone going to make someone else feel? The biggest excuse I hear from kids on um, cyberbullying type behaviors is I was just joking or even bullying behaviors. And we really need to teach our kids perspective taking and what will my actions, what will my words, what will my text, what will my post, what will putting up this picture indicate to other people? And what am I really doing with this? So helping our kids understand that. 45% of kids report having been the victim of mean or cruel behavior uh, in the last six months. 45%. That's a really a high number, and since I've been collecting this data, I've been collecting data on bullying and cyberbullying, um, probably over the last, what do you think, the first batch that I had was from 2012, that number was 12%. When I collected it again in 2015, the number was 25%, uh, and last year it was up to 45%, in the same middle school population. Now, uh, one of the reasons I'm hypothesizing and speculating is because more kids have more devices, so you're going to get higher rates of, of cyberbullying. But having the devices should not impact. We need to teach our kids digital citizenship and responsible use of technology. So we've talked about some of the behavioral. We've talked about some of the uh, social. Uh, let's talk about some of the psychological. It's one of my favorite areas. My background, by the way, I'm a clinical social worker. I have a doctorate in education. So I do a lot of work on the clinical uh, uh, piece of the psychotherapeutic and psychology, uh, as well as the educational piece as well. So from the psychological uh, um, approach, we see uh, strong relationships between technology and anxiety and depression and isolation and addiction. Uh, that's not to say that having a device makes you depressed or gives you anxiety, um, although maybe it does a little bit. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of positivity that comes from it. But we need to be wary of how we are interacting with our devices, how our children are interacting, and how they're being affected, uh, affected by their technology. Most kids will tell you that uh, their cell phone use enhances their lifestyle. Having a cell phone, it just you know, changes my life. I can connect with friends. It's amazing, social media, et cetera. But what a lot of the research indicates is the more importance they place on their devices, Right? They rate the device more important in their lives, the more likely they are to have elevated levels of anxiety, lower levels of subjective well-being, um, and lower academic performance. So it's not about the frequency of usage or social media per se, but it's the individual's relationship with the device. And in your packet, there's an article about the simplistic narrative versus the more complex narrative. It's not that technology is bad and it makes us depressed and it gives us anxiety. It does sometimes, but it also makes us happy and it also uh, you know, helps us connect with other people. But we have to look at the individual relationships with technology, whether it's our children. Is it a healthy one? Is it an unhealthy one? And just in case you forgot, I had a meeting with the Mets. Just wanted to put that out there. Um, everybody know what this is? Hashtag pound sign. Anyone know what the original word is? No, not pound? This is a trivia question. Tic-tac-toe, very good. No? No? Uh, Octothorpe. Octothorpe. I don't know why, I don't, you know. Anyway, in case it comes up in casual conversation, you'll be able to now tell people, although not in these social circles because everyone will know already. Um, but this is a hashtag. You see this a lot. I'll explain what a hashtag does. I don't want to embarrass anybody by asking, do you know what a hashtag does? It's really just a fancy filing system for the online realm. So when you put a hashtag in front of something, whatever follows the hashtag, it will be in the interweb world under whatever that is. So let's say uh, you want to say best school ever, right? followed by Cat's Hill, it would be hashtag best school ever. And then anyone who wants to look up what is the best school ever, you know, it would be there. It's basically filing it on the internet. Um, and so what we find is that people use hashtags for a lot of different things, positive things, negative things. Um, one of my favorite studies were by two psychologists. You know, some people have favorite sports players, you know, or favorite, I don't know, politicians, or favorite rabbis, or I'm a little, uh, a bit of a nerd. I have favorite psychologists. And my favorite psychologists are Peterson and Seligman. They founded the uh, positive psychology movement. And they did this amazing study where they asked people uh, to write down five things that they were grateful for at the end of the day. Um, and then they had the control group that did nothing. And what they found was that when people would write things down that they were grateful for, their overall levels of subjective well-being were much higher. They were happier people. And so uh, the fact that 
they um, were doing that, um, not only lasted while they were doing it, but even for three months after the fact, their, their subjective well-being was higher. So the flip side is if you write negative, you are going to create a negative mood for yourself. What do you think when it comes to digital technology? Are kids or adults more likely to post negative things or post positive things? Anyone look at Yelp ever? It's all negative. Almost all. Uh, what, I'll, I'll make it easier, the question easier. Delta gets you to your destination on time with your luggage <laughs> versus Delta gets you there four hours late and your luggage is in Hawaii. Which are you more likely to tweet or post about? So the answer is the latter. But what that does is it literally creates a negative schema. If we're more likely to post negative things, we are really creating a negative mood for ourselves. On the flip side, if we post positive things, we actually can elevate our mood. So one of the things that we encourage kids to do is if you're on social media, focus on posting positive, right? We actually have a campaign, post positive. <clears throat> um, but what we actually find is that uh, there was a study done that compared positive hashtags to negative hashtags, like success I love best versus fail I hate worst. And they found for every positive hashtag, there were two negative hashtags. Our natural inclination is to post negative, to be impulsive, to be disinhibited, and we post negative. And we want to help our kids to focus on posting positive. 85% of kids report using technology longer than they anticipated, right? So they don't have control. So we see the depression, the self-control, the, um, and again, these are the kids reporting it. Uh, the anxiety that we mentioned before, I mean, we can all connect to the anxiety piece. You ever forget your cell phone at home? You know that feeling right here where you're like, oh my God, I forgot my cell phone at home, right? Right there, that's anxiety, our connection to it. We go from this, oh my gosh, I left my cell phone at home, no one can get in touch with me, right? And the, we panic, panic sets in. And hopefully if we're well adjusted, it goes from, oh my gosh, I left my cell phone at home, no one can get in touch with me, to I left my cell phone at home. No one can get in touch with me, <laughs> right? And then it's like peace and calm and it's like Shabbos during the week, and we can relax. Uh, so the anxiety, the depression, that relationship, what is our relationship with technology? Is it enhancing our lives? Is it an intrusion? Kids get exposed to uh, graphic websites or violent content online, actually has a negative impact on their emotional well-being. 40% um, of kids report having looked up a website their parents would disapprove of. 43% say that they accidentally ended up on a website their parents would disapprove of. But perhaps most importantly, 57% of kids have seen an image or video clip that disturbed them. So it's not just that they are being exposed to content that might be objectionable, it's actually having a negative impact, uh, impact on their emotional state. When we ask parents, only about 20% of parents say their kids have been exposed to something that disturbed them. And so we see a little bit of that disconnect. We see that kids are experiencing things that they're not necessarily communicating with their parents. All right, so we talked about social, behavioral, and psychological. Day-to-day, -day, the day-to-day -day impact of technology. Um, school work is impacted, exposure. Physical health, criminal charges, college, uh, employment. Uh, just on the physical health, I actually read a study recently that kids uh, today are inhaling about 30% less oxygen than they were 20 years ago. 30% less oxygen. And it's not because they're a little less active. That is true, they are less active. Um, but not, I, by the way, I saw the kids playing outside after dismissal, playing ball. That was very nice. In New York, they don't do that. They don't play outside. Uh, you have good weather here, so I guess there's a positive in that. Um, and, uh, but the truth is, if you all, you know, you've, you're, you're a good audience, you've been sitting nicely, we'll do a little quick exercise. If you stretch your hands out, put your chin up, take a nice deep breath, Right? It feels good. You get it in your lungs. Don't worry, I'm not going to start meditating with you. Just, right? oh wow, we have people really into it. Take a nice deep breath. Now, pretend you're on your phone with your chin down and take a deep breath. It's a little harder. You're not getting as much oxygen. Anyone who took CPR first day, what's the first move you do if someone is not breathing? Head, chin, lift, right? You lift the head back. So we have to start thinking about doing the head, chin, lift uh, throughout our day, so we're getting the, now I don't know, there have been no longitudinal studies about kids with devices and how less oxygen may impact uh, development, um, but I'm going to speculate, I'm going to go out on a limb here, that more oxygen is better than less oxygen. <laughs> I'm going to just speculate that, don't hold me to it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure 
that's the direction I want to go in. <clears throat> um, digital footprints. Um, I actually I wrote a uh, controversial article a little while back, and it's controversial because I uh, you know. I want to get some attention to it. It's a controversial article. You should look it up. Um, but the article was as titled, um, Your Children's Digital Footprint Will Have More of an... That wasn't the title. This is what it was about. Your Children's Digital Footprint Will Have More of an Impact on Their Career Opportunities Than Their Academic Performance. Think about that. Their digital footprint will have a uh, bigger impact on their opportunities. Just recently, this past June, uh, Harvard University rescinded the acceptance letters of 20 students because of things they posted in a private Facebook group. Everybody hear about this story? 20 kids had their opportunities significantly, significantly impacted because of things they posted in a uh, private Facebook group. Not on Twitter, not in a public domain, private Facebook group. Now, what's amazing is, any Harvard alums here? Just, it's really hard to get into Harvard, so I hear. It, you really, from the time you're in preschool, that's got to be your goal. And everything's got to be focused on it. All your academics, your support, your after school, your extracurricular activities. These are disciplined kids that get into Harvard. You don't just float in. These are kids that you would not describe as impulsive, impetuous. Uh, these are kids that it's really hard to get in. I don't know if I'm conveying the difficulty of getting into Harvard. It's hard. And if these kids can be significantly impacted, every kid can. You know, you put things out there. When kids apply to high schools or colleges, uh, they look into in the job market, your digital footprint, what is online, what it says about you, the residue of your own actions and behaviors will be there. Um, everything you do online goes back to either an IP address or a Mac ID. I'm not going to get into the technical pieces of it, but every device and every network has its own unique signature. So whatever you do can be traced back to that signature. If your MAC ID is associated with an email address, and the email address is associated with a, ship, a name, first name, last name, shipping address, phone number, it's all connected. And there are people uh, and companies that actually spend time and money investigating this for data mining to sell you products. You ever uh, look up a pair of shoes online and then all of a sudden your email, your social media feed, everything is being flooded by that ad for that shoe. That is, uh, that is data mining and that is your IP address being tracked and traced back. I remember when I was redoing my kitchen, I was looking for a wine fridge, uh, you know, one of those uh, nice under the counter wine fridge. You ever come to me for a shop, just bring a nice bottle of wine and, and we'll be friends. Uh, and I was looking this up and the next week there was a sale uh, American Express had like an insider sale and it was on wine fridges. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's my lucky week. You know, I was looking, and it took me a while to figure this out. At first I thought it was my lucky week. But we have what we call IP addresses, if you're not familiar with this, every device, every network, and it can be GPS tracked and traced. Mm -hmm. Uh, so everything we want to tell kids is public and permanent. Everything you do online, and it all goes back to your digital footprint. Companies will try to get you, bring you in based on uh, clickbait to try to get you to click here. Uh, you're not going to believe what happened when this girl drank a Coke. I can see some of you want me to click. You want to know. You get things like you're not going to believe what your dentist isn't telling you. Any dentists in here? What aren't you telling me? <laughs> you can't tell me. All right. Thought we were friends. Um, Jewish day schools. One of the challenges that we face is our kids are experiencing one thing and we are experiencing another thing when it comes to technology. We had mentioned before that we kind of speak a little bit of a different language. Uh, our kids are what we call digital natives. We are digital immigrants. Uh, and much in the same way in the early 1920s when we had Jewish immigration in the United States where the parents uh, were speaking Yiddish and the kids were speaking English. It created a generational disconnect. Similarly today, our kids are speaking digital and we are speaking the proverbial Yiddish uh, when it comes to that. We see discrepancies. 62% um, of parents report having set rules and guidelines in the house, but only 32% of kids are reporting that there are set rules and guidelines in the house. 82% uh, of parents report having conversations about using the internet responsibly, but only 33% of students report that these conversations are taking place. 37% of parents uh, say that their kids have been disturbed by online videos and images, uh, and 57% of students. So we see there's a disconnect. We're not 
uh, we're not necessarily connecting. We're going to talk about why that is. But before we move on, I always felt if this whole public speaking career didn't work out, I would become a mentalist. Um, I'm serious. Have you ever go to those Pesach hotels or programs and the guy can literally read what's on your mind? Like, I can see you, sir. You want to go home. I'm reading that. <laughs> yes. Okay. See, I'm good, right? Accurate. All right, so I'd like to do a little quick exercise with you. Um, I'm going to ask you a question and you're going to give me the answer. But the only way this works is if you respond together all at once. So I'll ask you a question and you'll say, okay, okay? okay. I'll ask a question, you'll give me an answer, okay? okay. What's one plus one? Two. You guys are good. Ah, oh. ah. Technology. Oh. Anyway. The answer is two, as you saw very briefly. Let's try that again. What's one plus one? Two. Okay. Your child comes home from school. You say, how was your day? Fine. I heard fine, good. How was your day? Fine. Fine, good. Okay. Ah, there we go, good, fine. Not bad, right? No, you're not impressed. <laughs> All right. Your child comes home from school. How was your day? Fine. Fine, good, I've lost you. Um, what did you do today? <laughs> Now, why is it that I knew that that was coming? I'm not really a mentalist. This is the disingenuous conversation that we all have with our kids. How's your day? Fine. What did you do today? Nothing. Where's the iPad? You know, that's usually, <laughs> usually how it goes. Or how's your day? Fine. What did you do today? Nothing. Uh, can I play on the Xbox? This is the conversation that we have. And when we have this as our primary conversation, except for Friday night where we say, you know, what did you do in school this week? We get a little more information. Um, that when that's the primary conversation, it's very difficult to have conversations about safe and responsible ways of using technology. That's why we see that disconnect where we think we've had a conversation with them, but we actually haven't, in their minds, had a conversation. Saying it's 11 o'clock, get off the computer, that's not a conversation, nor is that a rule. And so if we want our kids to understand where we stand on technology and what the expectations are, uh, we have to have clearer conversations. So what can we do about it? What can we do, and we're gonna, I want you, if you have a pen, you can write notes, and we're gonna break into groups in a little while, but some of the strategies of what we can do, we talked about the social, psychological, behavioral, and day-to-day -day impact of technology, all these areas that are impacted by technology, uh, and the challenge of raising children in this generation, it's exhausting, that's the truth. And there is no magic pill. So we have to put that out. I really, I encourage you uh, to really focus on that article, the uh, simplicity versus the complexity of raising kids today. There are no simple answers. Uh, our kids experience two of the big challenges that they experience when it comes to technology is FOMO, you know what that is? Fear of missing out. And BE, anybody know what BE is? It's not BE, it's Rosh Hashem, no. Um, but everyone has. You ever hear that from your children? But everyone has an iPhone, but everyone has an iPad, but everyone has Snapchat, but everyone has fill in the blank, right? Everyone has. And the challenges that we experience with the everyone has is that we think, you know, we don't want our child to be the one left out, the one child that doesn't have, you know, virtual reality, you know, in their lives. Uh, that's a big thing now with the kids. Um, and so we need to recognize that there is power in numbers. Okay, all of you here as a group are stronger than the individual. And understanding that there's power in numbers will make a big difference in how you manage your children's technology. So we've collected data and here's some of the things that we found in similar schools to here. 80% of sixth to eighth graders own a smartphone, but only 9% of third to fifth graders own a smartphone. So that's an interesting finding because we see that there's a tipping point in the fifth to sixth grade. How many of you are fifth grade parents here? Okay. Um, either, either most of your kids are leaning towards owning their own smartphone at this point or they are not. Fourth grade probably they don't own their own smartphones. And so understanding that when your child comes home and says, but everyone has, might not be accurate. Another piece of information. Um, Use of social media, 89% of 6th to 8th graders are engaged in social media and 45% of 3rd to 5th graders. So understanding the norms and the social norms within your environment should help you to approach managing your children's technology more effectively. 
what are the norms in your community? What are the experiences? People ask me all the time, when should I get my child a smartphone? What's the right age? Okay? It really depends on the social norms of what's happening in your child's class. It's an unsatisfying answer, I know. Uh, but that's the reality. The reality is that our children are growing up in an environment, and what is right for your individual class may not be right for a fifth grade here, it may be different than a fifth grade in another school. Shut off times, okay? We've polled parents uh, from modern Orthodox Jewish day schools, and we've asked them, what's the ideal shut off time in your mind? And what we found was, uh, ideal shut off time for sixth to eighth grade, parents felt 9.30, uh, third to fifth grade, parents felt 7.30. And so these are things that we want to think about when it comes to managing our children's technology. What's the benefit of having a shutoff time? A shutoff time means your children don't have FOMO anymore. They're not wondering what's going on in their grade level chat because everyone's shutting down and they can get a good night's sleep and they don't have to worry about it. For the younger kids, for like preschool, first, second, third grade that don't have those grade level chats, you want to start thinking about are they utilizing the device to play games? We'll go to questions soon. Um, are they utilizing devices to play games? And can they shut it off? Is that part of their social experience? What is the maximum amount of recreation time uh, that kids should be on their devices? We polled parents. Uh, sixth to eighth grade parents felt 90 minutes would be the maximum amount of uh, recreational time. Third to fifth grade parents felt that 30 minutes. Having that steady, consistent approach to managing your children's technology is the way to go. I don't like putting specific numbers because it all goes back to the relationship that we talked about. Does your child have a healthy relationship? Do they not have a healthy relationship? I uh, recently spoke uh, with someone who told me that their seventh grader is on the computer at all times, all the time. I said, well, what are they doing on their computer? And they explained that they're creating um, they're actually at a business. They were creating an app, spreadsheets, right? Creating spreadsheets. Um, I said, do they have friends? Do they go out? How are they doing academically? It's not about the number, the hours of screen time. It's the relationship. And we need to start thinking about it in a more complex way. Many of us adults, our jobs are to sit, uh, is to sit in front of a computer screen. It's not the screen time that's inherently problematic. It's is it enhancing or is it uh, becoming a challenge? and a distraction in our lives. Having a family plan, how we approach technology is not just about our kids' behavior with technology, it's our approach as a family. Do we spend time without technology outside of Shabbat? Do we go dark for dinner, where we have a family dinner during the week where we don't use technology? Kids are looking to us for what we think is responsible with technology and how we are going to respond. 49% of kids say that their parents are the biggest influence in what they think is, uh, is um, responsible technology is. So we have a really important role as parents in helping to manage our children's technology. Yet, only 27% of students say their parents have spoken with them about safe and responsible ways. And it's not just a one-time speech. It's not you have the technology speech and then you, you move on. It's an ongoing conversation. It's an ongoing dialogue. And again, it's not a satisfying answer because it requires a lot of engagement on our parts, but as Rabbi Englander said, this is the issue of our generation. Parenting today is really difficult. There's a great article by a woman named Allison Slater Tate who talks about how our children are the first generation growing up in this technology-driven world, but we're the first generation of parents raising them. And that becomes a real challenge for us. We don't have... Um, standards that we grew up with to understand how to raise our children with this degree of technology mm -hmm. engagement. So it, it becomes a challenge. And part of that is for us to model responsible digital citizenship for our kids. Are we engaging in responsible use of technology? Are we on our devices uh, when our kids come home from school? Are we making eye contact with our kids? Are we communicating? Are we showing priority to the devices over our children and over our other family members? And so we need to take a more thoughtful and deliberative approach when managing our own technology. We've done some correlational analysis uh, we find that kids who say their parents is the biggest influence, their parents are the biggest influence of what they think is appropriate with technology, those are the kids who also report that their parents have spoken with them about uh, responsible technology use. They're the ones that imp report improved quality of homework as a result of their technology. They're the ones who report spending more time connecting with family and friends uh, as a result of technology. The other group, the kids that say no one influences me, they're the ones that are more likely to conceal their internet use, have online friends they've never met, not complete homework, not eat or skip meal, meals, and to receive uh, images 
that their parents would disapprove of. So we see the relationship between parental engagement with technology and, uh, and not having parental engagement. As parents, as difficult as it may be for us to stay on top of things, we really know, need to know the devices we're giving our kids. I can't tell you how many times I speak to parents and they say, oh, that device is internet capable, or that, that has a, a web browser on it, right? And they just didn't know. We need to know the devices before we give them to our children. We have to know what they're capable of and what we can do to better manage them. Know the software that, that we're giving them. We'll talk about that in a minute. And most importantly, their relationship with the device. It's not about a specific age. It's about their relationship. Um, I, uh, I get phone calls from certain, there are certain ultra right wing communities where people don't get devices till after they're out of high school. It does exist. And what we find is that in these communities, they get devices at 18, 19, 20, internet cable, and they don't know how to manage them. This is not about an age. If you get it at 18, 19, but no one's taught you responsible technology use, you're going to spend all your time on those devices in an irresponsible way as well. Um, we hear that. And you can give a 12-year-old uh, an internet capable device, but teach them responsibility and model responsibility and teach them and assess that their behavior is a healthy relationship with the devices and you will be much better off. Different devices have native products. I get off, often get asked what's the best filter. Um, I'm not, you know, devices should have filters, but to me they're the equivalent of a seatbelt in a car. A uh, child, right? You have a seatbelt, everyone should wear a seatbelt, but it doesn't teach you how to drive responsibly, right? We'd put drivers out, out of business if all we needed to do was give seatbelts to kids. That's what filters are. Um, with that said, uh, in the modern Orthodox Jewish day school community, only 8% of kids reported having uh, filters on all the devices that are available to them. And so that's actually a very low number, uh, but again, it's not just about the filters. Everybody know what these three icons are? Just Snapchat, WhatsApp, and Instagram. Um, what's amazing, these are the three most popular um, uh, social media um, apps that, that kids have today. Uh, we've polled them. Uh, I should have just come here because it seems that you guys knew that already. Uh, but well, these apps are very different. Every app has an age-appropriate rating on it. Is everybody aware of that? When you go to the app store and download the app for your child, um, there's an age appropriateness. So WhatsApp is rated age four years old plus. That's what they find to be the appropriate age for, for uh, WhatsApp. Now, Snapchat and Instagram are rated 12 years old plus, okay? That's what you know, the uh, minds that I guess Apple or whoever rated them at. Now, why is Snapchat rated 12 years old plus? When you go down to download an app, this is, you'll get a screen something like this. And the reason Snapchat is rated 12 plus is for infrequent mild alcohol, tobacco, or drug use, uh, infrequent mild profanity or crude humor, mild mature suggestive themes, infrequent mild sexual content, and nudity. And that is what they find appropriate for 12 plus. Obviously, some of you have different values. Um, and so it's important to know what you're giving your children access to. Something like Instagram is, again, it's a great, all of these so, social media, they're great. Snapchat's great, Instagram's great, but you have to recognize that you can't filter out content that you may find objectionable for your families. Uh, one of the challenges we talked about, kids staying up late at night, I strongly recommend a product called Hour Pact. Those are my uh, two kids up there. Uh, Our Pact is amazing because you can see that there uh, are schedules that you can turn your child's smartphone into a dumb phone. Uh, so from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., my child's device, all the apps disappear. No apps, and that's actually for my high school senior as well. I want her to get a good night's sleep as well. Um, except for the clock, you'll notice that the clock has a green check next to it the clock is not affected by the schedule. So that deals with the alarm clock uh, reasoning. Uh, during school, 8.30 a.m. to 4.15 p.m., her phone becomes a dumb phone. I don't see any reason that she needs to have access to social media or other apps during school. Again, these are my personal values. I don't in any way mean to tell you that these should be your values, but 
I want her to be focused on school and school. And you can basically set it up with your child. It shouldn't be say, here's the phone and it's restricted. Don't go home and take away your kids' devices. Don't go home and filter your kids' devices. Don't go home. This is an ongoing dialogue and conversation that you need to be having with your children about responsible technology use. Um, one of the things that you can do, I did with my daughter, is to create a contract, sample cell phone contract. I think it's included in the packet that you have. But it's not about the specific rules that I have with my daughter that you're going to create with your children. Um, it's about the ongoing dialogue. The process that we went through in creating this contract was my daughter said, everyone has an iPhone, everyone has an iPhone, everyone has an iPhone, everyone has an iPhone. And I said, I'm well, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. What do they have? Uh, everyone has an iPhone, right? And so you, know, you assess, does everyone really have an iPhone? And at some point I recognized basically all of her friends had smartphones. Uh, and so I said, OK, let me explain to you what my concern with digital technology and smartphones are. And I set up my computer with a projector and I made her sit through exactly what you're sitting through now. And uh, we went through the social, psychological, behavioral, day-to-day uh, -day impact. And I said, come up with a contract that addresses my concerns. And she came up with one version of it and then I reviewed it with my people. And um, then I sent it back uh, with revisions for her to review with her people. Her people were basically her friends that really felt bad for her that I was their, her father. Um, and we basically together came up with this contract, which we have revisited and renegotiated uh, over time. And it's really great to keep that dialogue and that communication going because what this does is it helps her to understand that technology is awesome, it's amazing, but there's a degree of responsibility and an ongoing communication that we have when it comes to technology. <laughs> So those are some of the strategies that we can incorporate in managing our children's technology. Six suggestions for family success that we recommend. That's a mouthful. I got to change that title. Um, one is understand your relationship with technology. Understand your children's relationship with technology. Is it healthy? Is it enhancing their experience? Uh, is it enhancing their social experience? Or is it negative on their emotional, psychological, behavioral, and social states? Have tech-free time at home. Go dark for dinner. We do that in my house. 10 minutes that we are home for dinner, um, or 10 minutes of the time we're home for dinner, it doesn't happen every night. There are no devices uh, around. It's not even that, like they're in my pocket, because that actually is a completely different experience. You can do your own experiments at home. Try having dark for dinner with a device in your pocket, or try having it with the device in the other room. Your focus, your ability to connect will be so much better just not having your device uh, in proximity going dark for dinner. Have personal and family rules. This is not just about putting rules on your children, it's about yourself as well. You're going to model appropriate uh, responsibility with technology. Um, I have a confession to make. I, um, when I daven chakras and I'm wearing talis and tefillin, um, I don't have my cell phone with me. I have it back. I don't, I don't, I don't think this to impress anybody or anything. Um, the good news is my, my, my chakras are down to six and a half minutes. And my Hebrew fluency has greatly increased uh, since separating from my phone. Uh, but the reality is it just seems like, in, like an inconsistent behavior to be there checking your email, et cetera. It's not even like a religious thing. It's just if I'm focused on something, that's what I want to be focused on. If I'm with my kids, if I'm focused on them, I don't want to have my device as a distraction either. Now, understanding the real world, you know, I'm not Pollyanna, you know, and Sometimes you have to respond to emails and texts. It's OK. Be transparent with your kids. You can say, you know what? My boss just emailed me. I got to respond to this, but then I'm with you. And then give them five minutes without your device distracting you. It's an amazing thing, just giving them those few minutes. So having personal family rules, that's easy. Following them is a little more difficult. Being consistent with them. Communicating with your kids, being transparent, and modeling responsible technology use. These are all strategies that we can incorporate uh, into managing, uh, better managing our family environment with digital technology. We want to improve dialogue with our children. We want the conversations to be more than just, how's your day? Fine. What'd you do today? Nothing. We want it to be more meaningful. We want to have strategic discussion. Tell me about your day. When we go dark for dinner, I sort of incorporate it into all the 10 minutes. So there's no devices. And tell me about your day at school. They're not allowed to get up from the table until they told me something new that they learned that day in school, or something interesting, or something that happened with one of their teachers, something interesting. And so we actually find out what's happening uh, for our kids during their school day. And so 
It's all about the relationships with your kids. When you are putting policies and rules in place in the absence of a relationship, kids interpret it as punitive and punishing. You know, my daughter uh, will say to me something like, oh, what, you don't trust me? You ever get that? I'm like, of course I don't trust you. You're a teenager. No. <laughs> You know, I say, I, of course I trust you, but I love you and I understand how technology impacts. The other thing I get was with the, you know, but everyone, but everyone has a device without a filter and, you know, free reign on the internet. And I just look at her and I say, you know, well, your friend's parents don't love them, so that's okay, you know. So these are some of the conversations that we have. Uh, but it really, it's amazing when you have a good relationship, the kind of policies that you, that you won't get pushback on. And if you're getting pushback on what we would consider reasonable policies, we need to assess the relationship with the technology. So it's really, it's complex. Don't oversimplify, it's complex and it's about relationships. I'm gonna show you, we're gonna close uh, this part of it. After this video, we're gonna break into different uh, sections. Um, I think uh, early childhood in that area. Um, what's in the back over there? But, well, the basic idea, and I just interrupt that for a second, the idea is what we're hoping that, as Dr. Shapiro concludes, you don't, you don't have to like, force yourself to go to a certain spot. You want you to engage other people around you, specifically those who are maybe who you know or who have a child in the same class. Ideally, focus on maybe one of your older children if possible. So get to a group of two people, three people, four people, five people, no more than that, to have this meaningful conversation of, okay, like, what do we do next? How do we take this, you got to give you practical information. How do you kind of give each other the strength or, 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 or set some standards or give each other some advice? Don't be afraid to tell each other what you're actually scared about or how you're going to, you know, why you're nervous about pulling this off uh, or improving your, your family life. Have those discussions with some other people here in this room. If you're like, I can't find someone, but don't worry, we're not going to, like, laugh at you or anything like that. Go to one of those sections and you'll find someone else, we hope, who, um, who is also looking to engage with someone else that age group. So it kind of goes age order around the room, from early childhood uh, all the way there to fourth and fifth grade. And those who are more interested in a middle school focused conversation up over there by the stage. Yeah, so I want you to remember one of the slides. There's power in numbers. There really is. And if you connect as parents, um, in really setting the standards and setting uh, the expectations. It's going to be a lot more productive. In your packets, there's a what can we do now, uh, what can we do page, uh, which gives you some springboards for the discussion um, on different ideas. It's a front and back page. And I just want to show you uh, this video uh, that was made by a school in Los Angeles, uh, which was really amazing because this video was made uh, conceptually. Kids learned about um, the idea of eye contact and communication skills and family dinners and they created this, they wrote the script, they videoed, they edited um, and it really is, is quite remarkable and to show you what kids can do and, and really they want this, they want the structure um, and let me just play this for you. Listen up Yavana boys and girls, we are challenging you to go dark for dinner this week. That means from this Thanksgiving Thursday through the following Thursday, we want to see if you can get off the grid during dinner. No iPods, iPads, iPhones, smartwatches, TV, or even a calculator. No talking to Siri, Google, or Alexa. We mean 100% digital free during dinner. What will you do during that time, you ask? It's a great opportunity to get to know the other people living in your home. That boy who sleeps in the room next to you, who your parents call your brother, this is a great opportunity to find out his name, how his day went, or share a story with him about your life. Try an actual smiley face instead of relying on emojis. This challenge is for parents as well. We promise your emails and text messages will still be there after dinner. Your Facebook timeline will survive without a picture of your salad. For y'all in the fifth or eighth grade that can complete this challenge for the week, there is a reward waiting for you. Just bring the fill that log provided to you in class, and we'll show you it was worth it. So again, the idea, what I love about it is that the kids really internalized it and they created their own content. They weren't just taking in information. And so at this point, we'll divide up around the room. Uh, Mrs. Tamima Feldman, my colleague, and um, Dr. Carmel will be walking around uh, and facilitating the conversation as well. We'll be answering questions and Thank you, move Dr. forward. Shapiro.